This is a Dreamcast disc and is for use only on a Dreamcast unit. Playing this disc on a hi-fi or other audio equipment can cause serious damage to its speakers. Dreamcast, up to six billion players. Welcome back to the stage of history. Why don't we play together? Hey, 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 it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go! Yeah, 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 yeah. Please stop this disc now. Now, 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 now. Hello and welcome to episode 88 of the Dreamcast Junkyard Dreampod, an episode we've decided to rebrand as the Esotericast in order of our very special guest. All will become clear shortly, but first, introductions. Uh, my name is Tom, and I'm joined by two of my regular hosts. First, he's a man whose actual voice is so high-pitched it can only be heard by dogs, and needs to be put through a modulator in order to be audible on this podcast. He's the master of fan translations, well, reporting on them. It's Lewis. Hi, Lewis. <laughs> Hello, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, this isn't my actual voice. This is just the way you're hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, outside, dogs are going mental running around in circles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, uh, he's our resident globetrotter, currently residing in the snow-covered winterland that is Germany, and sitting upon an Aladdin's cave of mini discs, stonewashed jeans, Aston Martin T-shirts. It's the 1980s. I mean, I mean, Martin. Welcome, Martin. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is, you're, <laughs> these intros are superb, by the way, Tom. I don't know if they're, they're rehearsed. They're absolutely uh, stellar. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I've. I, Globetrotter is something I used to be. Now I'm basically a, a prisoner, but I've surrounded myself with everything from yeah the 90s. So uh, I'm doing okay. It's quite appropriate to be on this podcast as well with our guest because I know you've uh, developed a, a recent love or desire to uh, collect arcade machines. So um, that's that's something we will talk about shortly. Superb. Um, uh, we were due to be joined by our very own cyberpunk Gary Oldman too. Uh, that's Andrew for those who are wondering. But he's too busy writing Dreamcast Year 9. That's the follow-up to Dreamcast Year 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So uh, <laughs> we're giving him a free pass this time. Uh, the devil makes work for idle hands and all that. Uh, finally, Johnny was on this episode. We have a special guest, as mentioned. Uh, he is the purveyor of the excellent video game Esoterica YouTube channel and font of knowledge when it comes to all things 3DOM2. Pippin at Mark, the Thomas Wave, and a more lesser known cool stuff from the forgotten chest of gaming history. His name is Anthony, and he's joining us on the show. Welcome, Anthony. Hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. I mean, I guess I'm the one that knows the most about the systems that people don't really care about that much. It seems like I'm the font of knowledge for things that people think are bad. And so I guess that's a good qualifier as any for me. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, that's the reason why we wanted to get you on the podcast. I've been a fan of your channel for quite some time now, and um, I just think that the it really appeals to me, that the, amount, the, the content that you put out really appeals to me, because I too am a fan of Esoterica, but I didn't really know how to put it into a term, you know, so video game Esoterica is, is, is perfect, really. Um, what I'd like to do first, though, is, is just talk a little bit about your channel, Anthony, if we, if we can, and, and just the, the beginnings of your your journey as a YouTuber. Um, how did how did you get started, really? Well, you know, I kind of just had the idea floating in my head for the longest time. And God, with YouTube, I wish I had actually started the idea when I wanted to, because it would have been a lot easier to get inroads then. But I just have always been collecting things for probably like, uh, God, almost 20 years now. And my collection is, it's esoteric, because some systems I have four games for, other systems I have 200 games for but I always had this desire to kind of research the things that I couldn't find information on if I look something up and I couldn't find an answer I thought well then why shouldn't I create an answer and my background is I've been a filmmaker for god I sound old now 20 years <laughs> I used to work in skiing making ski films like if you've ever seen a snowboard film or a skateboard film I did that for skiing so I figured I have all the hardware I have way too many cameras and I have spare time. So I figured I'll make like maybe a 10 episode series on the 3DO M2, see how it goes, 
you know, throw some information out there. And if people like it, maybe I'll keep making them. And I just uploaded 40 videos in a batch last week. So I think I'm getting close to like four or 500 videos in wow. about two and a half years. So I guess it ended up working out better than I expected and way more work than I thought. But yeah. it was just kind of my way of saying this stuff exists. It's cool. Let me tell you why it's cool. And let me feel good about having spent all this time collecting it in the first place. Just going back to your um, history with the snowboarding videos, do you own a fisheye lens? Oh, I had a bunch of different fisheye lenses that I used to put on the camera. That was like the technology of choice then. But as the years went on, I upgraded cameras and I was kind of on that transition from the fisheye to more cinematic. But I did have that giant piece of glass on the front. And let me tell you, with skis, I <laughs> shattered maybe like three or four of those. And they were always like $700 to replace. They're <laughs> delicate and... <laughs> Yeah, I haven't thought about that in probably 15 years until you mentioned it, but I'm even feeling the pain in my head of listening to those lenses shatter because somebody hit them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially any any kind of extreme sport. I can just think of like an intro sequence to a game from the 90s, which, you know, in low resolution with fisheye lenses and people doing jumps over like, uh, you know, banisters and whatnot. As a random aside, a few of my ski film shots ended up making it into... Johnny Mosley's Mad Tricks for the PlayStation 2. So a couple of the shots of the skiers in that game were things that ended up, I ended up shooting throughout my years traveling around doing ski films. So there is a weird... I was connected to video games before I got into talking about them by selling a few shots to the developers for that intro. I was going to ask, did, it, w it would have been interesting if, if you'd done those shots and not realized and then you were playing the game and saw your own shots and was just like, what? wait a minute that's that's me that's my that's my footage <laughs> <laughs> I, I that would definitely would have surprised me i would have been a lot more upset had they not asked but yeah it was it's fun just to be able to pick that game up and be like oh that was you know it was, it was forever ago it feels like a completely different life but just knowing the people in that game and them being my friends and they're like i like skiing i like video games and now all of a sudden i'm doing both at the same time that was a lot of fun seeing as so much time has passed are you allowed to tell us what you think of the game honestly Oh, it's terrible. It's the worst. <laughs> I got a free copy and I barely even played it. It was just, I wanted it to be everything it wasn't. I was so excited about it. It seemed like a great idea. I knew all the skiers involved in it. And then within 10 minutes, I think I turned it off and just never played again. It's, some of the other skiing games are getting better, but having spent my entire life doing it, all of those games make me want to do is go outside and actually ski. So for me, <laughs> I don't know they could ever make a game good enough that would satisfy my lust of putting my skis on and going back out to a mountain. But of course, I moved to Chicago and it's flat, so I really screwed myself over on that geographic pick. I, I think you raise an interesting point there, which is I feel like in the 90s in particular, on the home console side of things, there was a huge amount of titles being released and arguably they are now but they aren't made to the same kind of this triple a standard that everyone has in mind they there wasn't the the budget generally and there wasn't the development time that could go into them games were churned out much quicker so it was almost a homebrew type affair so you could be massively disappointed with a game and that was quite common i think i remember having my heart broken by sega touring car on the sega saturn oh yeah, uh, yeah. in particular but i i feel that happens a lot less now uh, just from my perspective that it's it's not really that you get so disappointed with the game i mean cyberpunk is, is a bit of a different out, outlier <laughs> that's that's the modern kind of outlier but before cyberpunk like what what was because it's, it's it's kind of rare you, you play something and it's uh and it is the way it is and you can be good or bad at it but Back in the day, in the 90s, there was actually some stuff like, you know, you, you imagine going to Electronics Boutique, paying 40 quid, coming back with Urban Chaos, and then, <laughs> you know, that would be your evening gone, and then your weekend. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, no, we're, we're, the, only, the only kind of similar feeling that I had was when, in the early days of the N64, when I was just looking to buy anything I could, I went into a game shop in Manchester and I was looking for something, anything that was new. And the only thing that was there that I hadn't seen before was Madden 64. Bear in mind that I, I had no prior knowledge. Sorry, Anthony, this is going to sound really bizarre to you, but I had no um, previous knowledge of the NFL. I didn't know how the game worked. And I was just like, it's the only new game that's on the shelf. I'm going to get it. I couldn't play NFL. Didn't know. I haven't got a clue. Yeah, I don't, none of us did. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't missing much. I, I, 
I think I played like a Madden game on the Sega Genesis and I have not played a traditional sports game since. I know they're huge everywhere, but for me, I just, I've never gotten into them. I don't know why. I know a ton of people that play Madden and love it and every other sports franchise. But for me, anything that you can play that you could go do in real life, I'd rather just go do that in real life. So like for me, video games are, I can't go kill a vampire in real life. I can't go to space in real life. So I do that in my gaming. But if it's sort of like, hey, I don't want to go play a baseball game. I can just maybe go outside and throw a ball or a rock at something. So for me, I've never been into those, which is really weird mm. to say, like having a YouTube channel, even if it's about esoteric stuff, like I don't know the last Call of Duty I played. I haven't played a Madden game since the sake of Genesis. So for me, it's not at all weird that that was a total miss with Madden 64. That's the type of game I would have wanted back then too. And then instantaneously regretted getting it within like mm. 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, bringing it back slightly towards the Dreamcast, Anthony, um, what is your history with the Dreamcast? I know that a lot of the stuff on your channel is related in some way, even if it's uh, almost like a very tenuous link to the Dreamcast. But th were you one of the? Uh, were you somebody who was there day one? Oh, I got there before day one, and it was a gigantic oopsies because I didn't know what region locking was at the time. I was at the age where I finally had my first job. I was a ski instructor. And I had seen the previews for Dreamcast, and I'm the person that spent like 40 minutes of their evening trying to download the first trailer on like a 56.6 dial-up <laughs> modem to see that first Sonic Adventure trailer in like 320 by 240 resolution, maybe like 12 frames a second. And my brain back then saw that trailer and thought, this is it. Like, they've perfected video game graphics. It's never going to get any better the nation's top scientists have all convened to make Sonic look cool. <laughs> so I imported a Japanese Dreamcast to get it early. I can't remember what vendor I bought it through, but I ended up waiting for the FedEx truck with a money order in my hand that I had to go to the post office to get. And all I got was Sonic Adventure and a Japanese Dreamcast. And that's all I played. I'm like, I can play Sonic Adventure until nine nine ninety nine, and then I can buy whatever I want. So I go out on launch day, buy a copy of Soul Calibur, come home, and then quickly learn what region locking was oh, and no. had to buy a brand new Dreamcast with money I didn't want to spend. So I got to the launch party early and totally ended up with a Japanese Dreamcast that only had one game I could use. So I definitely don't regret it now, but back then I felt pretty stupid. I mean, how, 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 how long before the American launch was that? Did you have that Dreamcast? Was it months? Did you just have this one game that you were playing over and over again? God, I think I got it in like January or February of 99 because I know it was like fall, like late summer, early fall mm. of 98 that it came out in Japan. And I probably, you know, around November in Vermont where I grew up is when the snow starts to hit. So that's probably when I started working as a ski instructor and, you know, putting checks in the bank. So I think it was probably like, it was definitely snowy when I got it. So it was winter of early 99 that i got that dreamcast so i probably had to play sonic adventure for eight months until anything else was available and i definitely played it for eight months i was the coolest kid in high school with that dreamcast until september came and then i stopped being cool all over again just think you were probably the the, the number one sonic adventure player in the whole of the united states by that point I may have had the most time in for sure. I beat it with yeah. all six characters and then basically just deleted my save file and said, screw it, let's do it again. And even today, if I sit down and play that game, I will finish it. I did a video on it just to talk about it. I'm like my top five Sonic favorite games of all time. And I ended up playing for six hours when I just needed 30 minutes of footage. And I can't turn that game on if I don't want to sit there and play it because I'll lose a day to it and not even notice. Yeah, yeah, I have a similar uh, story that I didn't have a VMU when I had Sonic Adventure, so I had to start the game over again every time I turn the system off. And I got so sick of seeing that opening section with Sonic and, you know, I was like... The I whale. I don't want to do it again. Oh, it's giving me flashbacks. <laughs> well, that, was, that was the worst back then because you'd always convince yourself... I don't want to spend money on a memory card. I need yeah. Yeah, another yeah, game. Right. So I had the same thing with PlayStation 1. I got it for Christmas, and I didn't really know what a memory card was. I was My parents bought it for me at that point. I'm just like, I guess I'll just continue to play the same level over and over again. And I remember leaving consoles on overnight to not mm. lose yes. like my progress. And, I mean, they 
I never once crashed. I'm still impressed that I can still leave a Sega Genesis on for eight hours and mm-hmm. come back to it. It's perfectly fine. I, you know, turn my Xbox One X on and then within an hour, the thing is crashed somehow. <laughs> yeah. I actually miss the days where you could just trust your hardware. I mean, I'm, I'm on my third PS4 because they keep breaking and I'm pretty sure I could drop my Dreamcast downstairs and just pick it up, dust it off and keep playing it. So I miss <laughs> the fact that I could trust things a little bit more. You pl- having played Sonic Adventure like this is a really interesting point that I'm I'm going through myself playing games and really sticking to kind of one game because now there's there's just there's almost infinite games. There's more games around than there is time left for any of us for sure. <laughs> without getting too morbid, but you get the point. <laughs> But the, the, the point is that then actually what you want to do is kind of really invest yourself in a game. And it's it's a bit like Spotify and music. Um, you can sit there and you're scrolling, oh, there's nothing to listen to. But then you could just get out the CD that you've heard hundreds of times and listen to it again. And it's very much that way, I find, with some of the classics from the Dreamcast library, but also, yeah, from all sorts of different systems. Yeah, I did the math on my, sh- I call it my shame pile, games that I haven't played or mm. games that I still have in shrink wrap, or mm-hmm. I will readily admit games I accidentally bought twice because I forgot I owned, and <laughs> I've done that. I don't have enough time left in yep. life. If it took me five hours to beat every game I haven't finished or yep. even started, I think I'd have to be like 150. So I know that I will never get around to it. And part of that, I actually feel good about that because it means that I don't have to feel bad about playing them. I don't have enough time, so I can't yes. make myself feel bad about not doing it, but... I bought Bust to Move 4 for Dreamcast <laughs> twice because I forgot that I actually owned it already. So I have two copies of that in my collection, and they've been there for years, and I don't know why I haven't sold one. I just kind of keep it around to remind myself, look at your phone and your list of games mm-hmm. before you buy something because you got excited you found it because there's a good chance you might own it. Yes, I ended up somehow with three copies of Wild Metal for Dreamcast, and it's not <laughs> a game I like. I just ended up with them. I don't know why. <laughs> I think they might be multiplying. Um Anthony, um, let's move back to your uh, your your channel. Um, now, one of the things that actually drew me to the channel in the first place was your um, 3DO M2 content, and then from that, I got quite obsessed with the uh, the Pippin Atmark content. Uh, the Pippin Atmark is a console that I'm, I've been quite interested in for quite some time, being an, an Apple fanboy as well, going all the way back to the sort of the early 90s. Where does this kind of I, I, I'm hesitant to call it obsession, but where does this kind of uh, obsession <laughs> with the uh, the 3DO M2 come from with with you? It's it's really simple. People ask me that question a lot. And it's not as exciting as an answer as I'd love it to be. Um, I had a 3DO when it came out because my father loved technology. Anything that you could play a game on, he would never admit it, but he loved playing games so much so that we had to take away our. We had an NES, and he got. I can't remember the name of the shmup. I think it was Tiger Heli. He would start biting his tongue when it would get hard, and we'd be like, your tongue's bleeding. You have to stop playing. <laughs> so anytime a new game console came out, if I could get my dad excited about it, he would probably bring it home. So we got a 3DO around launch, and then, of course, magazines start talking about the new 3DO M2 upgrade because originally it was supposed to be something that slotted into the side of the 3DO mm-hmm. expansion bay, so you could upgrade your 3DO. And I'm like, well, I really enjoy the system. It's fun. And magazines were really hyping it in the 90s. So I'm like, well, yeah, I'm in. I want one of these things. And then having played the original D and seeing previews for D2 on the console, then I was even more sold. I'm like, I love the original game. I want to play this again, more of it. So I went to EB Games in the mall, and I put my $5 down for a 3DO M2 pre-order. They were taking pre-orders for them, oh, and they, then it got canceled. They, they were. They were taking pre-orders for the, for the M2 at that point. They were, but, I mean, it was EB Games. I think they would take a pre-order on a ham sandwich if you gave them $5 <laughs> to do it. So I don't – I mean, it kept getting release, you know, approximate schedules. Like, you know, like, oh, it's going to be summer 96, fall 96, spring 97. Then it got canceled. And, of course, in my kid brain, this was – a big travesty how could they cancel something you know that they were going to release not knowing how close it actually came to coming out and then i quickly forgot about it and then in like 2005 or 2006 i found out that they had released five arcade games on the hardware konami did all five of them and i found out oh the m2 is technically real even if it's not a game console so i did a little research poked around here and there and then in earnest about five years ago started really trying to find it and found out that 
it exists on a lot of variants and there's a lot of different alphas and betas to play things that I've patched up and coded for. But for me, it was something that I wanted and couldn't have. And I'm an only child, so I'm not usually great with things I don't get. So I decided to figure out how to get it myself. And I now have 11 3DO M2s and I have a console prototype sitting in a box just to my right that I haven't shown on the channel yet. That's the finalized console design in a box. Wow. So you should be seeing that soon. But I just ended up deciding to, you know, start sending inquiries out in the world and see what I found. And I ended up finding out a lot of stuff that exists, but it's all down to childhood disappointment of it being cancelled. That's why I got into it. That is an incredible story. Um, I share your um, kind of fascination with the M2. I, I didn't have a 3DO at the time. I got one later on. But when the 3DO M2 was a, a thing that was being shown in the magazines, it was, as you say, it was going to be a, a, an add-on for the 3DO. Um, I think the term for, for that kind of console at the time was an exotic console. I remember the Atari Jaguar was in the same kind of uh, category it was like this thing it was better than a mega drive or a genesis it was better than a super nintendo uh, but the saturn and playstation had either just come out or they were coming out soon and i can just remember looking at these consoles in the magazines and going oh wow i'd love to own one of those you know look at the graphics they look amazing and then for the m2 uh, just to hear that you've got 11 m2 boards so i've got nine arcade boards and a kiosk unit, which is a big giant box. So it's an M2, but it just looks like any sort of audio receiver. And then I have the console beta or like dev unit behind me. And then at one point I had a Cirrus Logic 3DO M2 powered graphics card because 3DO had licensed the M2. It's not a GPU, it's like an APU, but they licensed it to Cirrus. They made one prototype card and I did have that, but I ended up selling that to a collector who collects old exotic GPU is just because for me it was just a fun conversation piece for him it was the holy grail so I'm like well you'll like it more than I will you can have it but I had 12 at one point but I've got 11 now which is probably like eight too many <laughs> <laughs> um, are you talking to somebody who's got 11 Dreamcasts on a shelf behind him so don't don't worry about that so the M2 itself then the, the actual console um, I, I, I'm sure I read recently that it was it, it actually got turned into other things like um was it like a microwave? Not a microwave, like a fridge or something? Or did it get used in other ways? It's a coffee machine. Coffee machine. So no yeah, way. It's, yeah, it's a coffee machine. It's an ATM machine in Russia. Um, and then probably other things. The one bummer about that piece of hardware is that there's no controller port in and there's no place on the PCB to solder a DB9 mm. port onto. So you can't actually control the games with it. So it's it's an interesting piece, but you can't actually play anything on it. But yeah, it's... Apparently, at one point in time, like 15% of all ATMs in Russia use 3DO M2 hardware. And if you were walking <laughs> around, you know, Japanese subways, you could order a coffee on a 3DO M2. And I mean, maybe they were in beer bending machines. Maybe you could get a beer. But that was the biggest industry for the 3DO M2 was ATMs and vending machines, which is really fun to think about, but also horribly disappointing because it should have been playing video games. It's funny because, you know, the, the size of, let's take the PS5, I remember teasing my brother, I think, as soon as I saw it, and I was like, oh, yeah, does it make coffee? Ha, ha, ha. And then here we are talking about a, uh, a console that actually did, in some kind of twist, exactly as Anthony was saying, this kind of, isn't it interesting how it was used and it's actually all these microchips are used everywhere and no, no, no. But then at the same time, it's kind of depressing that video game console. Imagine you're on the you're that video game console and you're on the supply line, like being made in, in the in the factory, and and you don't get put in the box that ends up being in some kid's home to play video games or whatever. You end up in some kind of Russian ATM, you know. <laughs> I, suppose uh, I suppose it's comparable to it's quite a common knowledge now. The the Atari Jaguar yeah. became uh, was it dental equipment. Um, yes <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it was a, it was an x-ray machine they used the molds and you would plug in different cartridges to do different functions on the x-ray machine. i remember when that came out and somebody ended up finding those old molds mm. that the dental offices or whatever manufacturer would use and they i remember they remanufactured like a run of a thousand like translucent jaguar cases because they were the third owner of those molds after the jaguar x-ray machine was that that was the that was the chameleon, wasn't it? The the Cole, oh, oh dear. Was the, what was it called? The, the Coleco chameleon, the yeah. That's it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, just moving on slightly to another uh, console from antiquity, uh, the Pippin Atmark is one that really kind of fascinated me, as again, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, being an, a bit of an Apple fanboy. Uh, I mean, the, the Pippin Atmark was essentially a consoleized um, mid-range Mac, wasn't it? And I, I've watched so, several of your videos on that system, and um, the, 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 the Racing Days one kind of sticks out to me just because it looks like a quite a nice kind of tech demo of what it could do. But ultimately, the, the the Pippin just kind of failed in every respect. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I remember seeing ads for the Pippin in the '90s or hearing mention of it. But I mean, getting a black U.S. Pippin, that's like a two thousand dollar console where you can get the white, you know, Bandai Atmark Pippin mm. all day long for like three, four hundred dollars, just because it was huge. Well, it wasn't huge in Japan. They've released some over there, like two hundred thousand. I think that they say like maybe five thousand made it out in the U.S. But you can take half the Pippin games and put them in a G3 laptop from that era. I showed in one video, like it isn't even have exclusive software, but I mean, racing days was interesting because it shows you what it could have done is like a tech demo, but it's basically like the most underutilized piece of hardware I've ever seen because it is basically just point and click games. And I got it because why not? I always want to check it out and I've enjoyed playing around with it, but that's another console that, had it been marketed well and actually made it into homes, like I think there could have been like a ton of great software for it because you have things like, you know, Marathon. That's an incredible game. Like being able to play that with a controller on my couch is awesome. But unfortunately mm. for, you know, kind of like the Jaguar, it's got Alien versus Predator, amazing game. But then you look at all the other games around it and you started thinking like, okay, the Pippin is just a super marathon machine. It's not much else, but it's a lot of fun to play around with. And, I am still doing things, trying to make it run software that it's not supposed to. I got it running Wolfenstein 3D a few weeks ago, so oh. it can do that now too. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it's a console that even though it doesn't really have any connection to the Dreamcast, I, I, in my mind it kind of occupies the same space because it was a system that was essentially, it was a console, but it could do so much else as well. Like the Dreamcast was marketed as a almost like a business machine in some ways in, in Japan. Uh, and we will sp speak about that in a, in a little while. Um, but before we do, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the the 3DO connection with the Dreamcast. And there's no better place to start than that than with uh, the games of Warp and uh, the late Kenji Ino. And I think the most uh, probably the most famous game is uh, is D2, which started as a an M2 game and then migrated over to the Dreamcast. And uh, you did a, an amazing video recently, uh, Anthony, where you looked at the um, sort of the hidden messages and the hidden meanings, not just in D2, but in the, the other games in the series. Um, Lewis was the one who actually put, put me onto this video. So thanks for that, Lewis. But um, it just an absolutely visionary guy, you know, and th some of the stuff that he was doing, he's just off the chart, you know, with, you know, with the secret messages and the use different kind of physical uh, media to find hidden things in the packaging. Um, can you talk a little bit about that just to explain to people what, you know, what we're on about basically? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember when I first got D for the 3DO and I just fell in love with the game. It was kind of like an evolution of like the classic point and click adventure game. And mm. it had horror, it had vampires it had, it had all the things that I would want as a kid and still as an adult, like, Oh, it's a horror game with vampires. Like that's going to be my thing. But they released a second copy for the 3DO called, D's Diner Director's Cut. And the reason I originally bought that was because it had a trailer for the M2 version of D2. But additionally, there was two menu options that were grayed out. You couldn't select them. And for the longest time, nobody knew how to select them. One person had figured out the third option by going into a hex editor and starting to dismantle the files to understand how it worked. And that's how weird and deep some of these things get we're you know combing through the hex looking for slight clues as to how to make something happen yeah and they ended up finding out that there was a hidden code behind the original 3d version of d because it shipped with this little red like piece of cellophane kind of like when you were a kid and you had those red and blue 3d glasses mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would give you a headache within like 20 seconds <laughs> and we realized that if you put that piece of paper over the artwork behind the case and the only way you would know it was there if you took the CD out and looked through the little spindle hole, you could see a bit of ink. All of a sudden we found, you know, up, down, left, right, A, B, A, B, start. It's not the Konami code, but something very similar. And that unlocked option three. So I started thinking, 
okay, well, if there's a hidden code in the first release version of D for the 3DO, I wonder if there's something in the second version, D's Diner Director's Cut. So I dismantled my copy, and there is art behind the second disc. And in this instance, you can't even see the art through the hole. They've actually hidden it so that you can't see that there's any ink behind it. And I took the case apart, did the whole video about it, and we ended up finding that it just said the name Laura over and over again. She's the protagonist of almost all of Kenji Ino's games. And I didn't, I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, well, how do you enter in Laura? There's no code entry screen. And then another person on Discord, this guy, Arcane Aria, said, maybe Laura means left A, up, right A. I had to do that in my head. And he entered it in. And the fourth option that no one had ever seen before finally unlocked. And like I said, I talked with Kenji Eno for maybe a couple days on email many years ago, a few years before his death. And I'd like to think that he'd be super happy that you know, maybe someone in Japan figured this out 20 years ago. I can only research things in English, hmm. but I'd like to think he'd be happy that, you know, in 2020, we were still taking apart his games and trying to figure out these crazy codes. And, you know, you hear a lot of like, you know, Kojima being mentioned as an auteur or somebody like Suda51, but hmm. Kenji Ino back then was doing things with games and design and concept that like we're now celebrating and saying, you know, Hideo Kojima's amazing and of course he is but so few people know about kenji you know and warp and all the crazy and amazing things they were doing it's fun to talk about them because those games and his aesthetic deserve so much credit kind of laying the foundation for some of these other people like suri 45 doing deadly premonition like this weirdness has a lineage directly back to Eno, but it was also fun to crack codes and take apart games yeah that that video gave me it gave me like it made my spine tingle when i was watching it it was just so amazing and 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 things like the way you mentioned the um you know winds of regret real sound i mean even things like that which were so out of this kind of just who would who would who would create a game for people who couldn't see on a mainstream console other than kenji you know that came packed with seeds in <laughs> the case <laughs> i and i still have my seeds i think for a video this spring, I'm going to try to plant them and see if they grow. I don't know why I want to open them, but I, I'm hmm. going to try it. In this spring, I'll do a video series, and we're going to try to grow the seeds out of that package, see what happens. I'm nice. assuming nothing, but it'll be fun either way. I mean, isn't isn't there a connection between Real Sounds, Winds of Regret, and also D2? That also had a different – it had a D2 shock demo in it. So what hmm. it is, it's like a – I don't want to call it a beta version of D2. It's very close to retail. But if you had a save file on your VMU from that, you would unlock another secret video in the Japanese copy of D2. It doesn't exist in the English copy because, of course, we didn't get the demo. So taking those two videos and putting them together, I had a translator do a literal translation. Then my wife and I tried to grammatically rewrite it in English because she's the writer, not me. She did all of that work. I just kind of edited it together. But they were... Kenji Ino was like giving us all this content from the original version of D2 in the Dreamcast versions. I think mm. he wanted us to see it because a lot of work went into, there's actually two different M2 versions. I haven't talked about the first one, but before D2 on M2 was a fully three third person game, they had finished like half of a version of it being like the original D, just full FMV renders. And there's only like three screenshots of that in existence and i've never found the files but d2 for the dreamcast is actually the third version of d2 that ever existed from warp yeah it's fascinating i mean i i have actually seen that video because um i did i, I don't know how i found this out it was years ago i, I managed to, i did actually have a copy of real sound and with that d2 shock um disc did the whole put uh, the file on the, the vmu and then go in and view the uh, the warp video i just was wondering if anthony wanted to just speak a bit about his kenji eno email exchanges yes. i don't know yeah, if yeah, there's yeah. anything of that you would want to share with us because that's deeply fascinating that you're able to share some words with the man himself oh yeah absolutely i mean he was very gracious when we emailed like i said it was maybe like over three days years and years and years ago and sadly i lost the emails because i think that was like a yahoo or aol account back then mm. but you know, I just had sent him an email out of the blue. I think it's when he was working, when he had the company from yellow to orange, or maybe it was Super Warp, one of the other companies he had developed after he had closed down Warp. And I just remember 
sending the most basic email, like half fanboy, like, you know, I love your games. Thanks so much for making them. You know, I'm really curious what ever happened to the M2 version of D2. And he emailed back and said that he didn't have any files for it, but that he would look and he was, you know, genuinely appreciative of me enjoying the game. And he just asked me, you know, what was it about that game that you really appreciated, <laughs> you know, and, you know, we were trying to, you know, we were talking in English, you know, his English is much better than my Japanese, which is to say I don't speak or read any of it. But, you know, he was just genuinely curious to know what sort of impact that game made on me and why I would, you know, why an American kid would send a Japanese game developer an email to talk about something. I think he was surprised that something he had made had, you know, impacted somebody that much. But I just told him, like, I, you know, I love the stories, you know, how different and unique they were, all the musical compositions, because I think, you know, a lot of people that know his games don't realize he was an extremely accomplished, you know, composer and musician. And, you know, even now, like he, the music from those games is just something I can listen to without playing them. But it was just a fun little exchange. And he said that he would you know, ask around to see if he knew of anybody else that had any of the M2 file that was well before anybody knew the hardware even existed to run them on but you know unfortunately i think maybe you know 12 to 18 months later he sadly had his heart attack and passed away but he was happy to talk to me for those three days about the game and just super happy to hear that somebody had really enjoyed him that much well wow. yeah he was a a pretty incredible developer i yeah, he, um, I mean, just D2, D2. I mean, I don't think enough people give D2 enough credit for kind of what it does on the Dreamcast. Like the game incorporates so many different elements. Maybe it doesn't all stick, but he was really doing just these wild sort of almost experiments with his games. I mean, not to spoil too much for anyone who hasn't finished D2, but um, the... <laughs> I guess it is a spoiler, but the final boss in D2, I remember it like has this whole thing where it takes away your vision. It takes away like the sound so you can't hear anything and you're basically expected to kill it while all this is going on. And I'm just thinking like, who do, who's done that in a game? Other, you know, he was th just thinking of all these ways to kind of sort of push the boundaries of games, you know, like we talked about with um real sound you know making a game for um blind gamers just yeah he was i don't know he 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 almost seemed like he looked at games sort of deeper than you know the average developer like he was always looking for new and strange things to do yeah definitely i mean when he made a game it always seemed like to me at least he loved the idea and wanted to make a game and you know not to knock current developers but so much of gaming now is like we need to put in a structure to make sure this pays back the development costs and mm -hmm. so much more money in the end. It always felt like when Kenji Ino made a game, it's, I have an idea, I'm an artist, this sounds cool, let's make it and see what happens. And I, I feel like that was like the 90s in a nutshell for like a lot of games being, we want to do this, so why the hell not? And if people buy it, great. And if don't, they don't, they don't. And that's why you see like, so many different companies. I listened to one of your other podcasts a few weeks ago when you guys were talking about Lack of Love, which is one of my absolutely all-time favorite Dreamcast games. And that company, Love Delic or Love Delic, exists for like two games total. And they had their time and place. And now I don't think you'd get anyone to let someone make a game like that. And that's mm -hmm. why I really miss, you know, the Dreamcast era and before, which was just you could start a company, make a game, do something, uh, whatever you wanted to do. And then if it didn't sell you probably just went to work somewhere else and we don't get that as much anymore. And I miss yep. all of that. Just moving forward a little bit to more kind of modern developments. Um, the Atomis wave stuff that's been happening in the Dreamcast community is absolutely fantastic. Um, for those people who don't know, the Atomis wave was a, uh, an arcade system that was developed by Sammy and uh, was discontinued quite not, not as quickly as the Dreamcast was discontinued, but uh, it's not, it's not current, but um the Dreamcast community, as you know, wonders never cease. Uh, people such as a guy called Megavolt eighty five has been uh, porting games that hitherto have, have never really been played or talked about online, at least. Um, so things like Kenju, Faster Than Speed, Metal Slug Six are all now freely available online and can be played on Dreamcast hardware. Um, Anthony, I watched your Kenji video, and in that video, um, you mentioned that you had something to do with how that all came about. Is that right? 
Very little. I I sent the files to people, and that's how they probably got out. And I was in Arizona for a friend's wedding, the only time we traveled last year, and I got a random email from a Japanese Yahoo account with two executable, two bin files in it saying, you might want these. That was the whole message, and I never got a reply. <laughs> and inside of it, and a few people had had these before, and of course, like anything beta or unreleased, like some people share them, some people don't. I have a definite affinity for sharing them but that's just me and it said kenju and force five and of course i was you know halfway across the u.s at a wedding i didn't have my hardware with me but when i got back i put them into a naomi emulator because they were all set up as like naomi netboot files mm -hmm. and it was kenju and force five and i did some videos on those before they were you know i use the word ported but it's really just modification to the roms to get them to execute on dreamcast but i sent them to some other people and now here we are. So if I had anything to do with it, it's you can't see my fingers, but I'm holding them very close together. It's damn near nil. But I got them and I sent them to some friends and suddenly yeah. now we're playing it on Dreamcast. And here we are, yeah. Um, so in some ways we do have you to thank uh, for that. So um, I think uh, I speak for the whole Dreamcast community when I say thank you. Um, oh, no. <laughs> Whatever little bit I did, you're welcome. And that's I love sharing betas, alphas, things I find, demos. Like, the more that's out there, the better. I remember when uh, Gartha got released finally mm. for Dreamcast after there was this back and forth of would we get to play it, wouldn't we? Mm. And the more that comes out, the better. Like with The Simpsons Bug Panic, if a certain type of a person gets that file, we're never going to see it. We're never yeah. going to play it. We're never going to get to experience it. Or you have somebody that has this thing and says, like, this is amazing. People need to check it out. So whatever little I'm able to send out into the world to share with other people is my pleasure because it gets more people excited in the things I like to talk about. So really I'm just kind of catching people and being like, Hey, come obsessed over the same weird stuff that I do. <laughs> totally. I mean, I, I, have documented this on, on our blog, um, years and years ago, but, uh, the, the, the gentleman who I would like to remain anonymous who, and I will, I will honor that request. Um, who has several dreamcast, uh, uh, GDs of games that uh, were in development, such as Colin McRae Rally 2, the Dreamcast version of that, and uh, and several other things um, that he asked me not to uh, talk about. If that was me, I, I'd be straight on to Dreamcast Talk going, you know, I've got this stuff, who can help release it, you know? Uh, I don't, I don't see, personally don't see the point of keeping things to myself when we can share it amongst the community and all benefit from it. So I'm very much in the same same frame of mind as you. Anthony. We just need to convince more people to do that. And that's what I always try to do. Like, it's way more fun to release it. I mean, because then you own it because it's cool. That's my opinion of like these babies mm -hmm. and unreleased things. Like we collect them because they're really interesting and we love them. So why wouldn't we want to share them and talk to more people about it? And unfortunately, I haven't found anything recently to release, but hopefully sometime soon I'll find another random thing and be able to send it out to the world. But we'll see. I think there is also a, as a tendency of people, especially in the current climate, to try and maybe um, benefit financially from things that they find. So a perfect example of that would be the, um, was it Deer Stop? No, Deer, what was it? Deer Avenger 3 that came out a few years ago. Somebody found it in a, in a yard sale and it was this uh, Dreamcast port of a, of, a, of a PC game called Deer Avenger. And um, it, they actually auctioned it. I think, I think Adam Corolla ended up getting it eventually but i think he paid for it and it's just I, it doesn't sit doesn't sit well with me that to be honest i'd like to uh, see things as released out into the wild for free personally but that's just me um okay uh let's move on to some specific dreamcast esoterica i'm, I'm hoping you'll find this interesting anthony uh, because these are some of the things that i've written about in the past on our blog um now, the first thing that I thought might be of interest is a thing called the uh, Dreamcast Dreamwire, Dreamwire service. Now, this uh, takes advantage of a thing called the PHS system, which is a system in some parts of the world, which is like almost like a, a network of uh, low-powered Wi-Fi. So I'll try and explain this the best I can. Uh, mm -hmm. A few years ago, um, somebody on uh, found this thing on... A Yahoo auction, and it was called the Dreamwire. So I did a little bit of sort of digging into it and, and managed to find out a little bit of information. 
and basically it was a, a prototype for a thing um, which would allow the Dreamcast to connect to this thing called the, the PHS system, which is Personal Handy Phone System. Um, it's a little bit like, um, do you remember WAP on your phone, or WAP? Yeah, it's WAP, wasn't it? Yeah. This is pre, this is pre i mode, I think. So so when I went to Japan, there was all the i mode, which is kind of owned by Docomo, and it's kind of still going. But this is the pre i mode, so they've always been ahead of the curve, and this is Japan being even further ahead of the curve of where we were back then. This thing exists in a um, in a prototype format only, so you can connect it to your. You put one end in the Dreamcast, you put the other end into a mobile phone, a compatible mobile phone, and then that. Dreamcast uses the mobile phone as a sort of a modem to connect to this thing called the PHS system, and then you could get on the internet and uh, do your usual browsing thing through through Dreamcast or whatever service mm. it was that you had at the time. Um, there's only that one prototype that I'm aware of that has ever kind of surfaced, and that one went for £530 or $700 at the time. Um, it does have its own HK, HKT number. It's HKT4400. So if anybody knows anything more about that, please let us know. I really like the picture of the Dreamcast with this antenna sticking out of the back. I think <laughs> that just looks, that's just hello, end of the 90s. I love it. There's something beautiful about that. Yeah, so that, that was the next thing I was going to come on to. So that's the official Dreamcast wireless adapter. And there's very little information about this. Basically, this thing was shown in a magazine in Japan, uh, and there's literally like one image of it that exists. And it's a pretty poor low res image, but it's imagine the um, the Dreamcast modem, but instead of where the cable goes in the back, it's got a little antenna that sticks up, and on the image itself it does say PHS. So I'm thinking that maybe that is an alternative version of the, the version that you would use to connect a phone to it. So mm. it would connect to the PHS system through that modem connection. Yep, that that's that's my understanding of of how that would have worked. So instead of like having using a phone as a, as a modem, you would have your business phone or whatever for its own use. And then, yeah, this would be a separate way to connect to a PHS. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a modem. It's called the modem and connects on the modem port. But yeah, I, I love this stuff. It's, uh, it's just so unique and Japan of the time because Japan still does cool stuff now, but it's not like everything's become a lot more homogenized. And at the end of the 90s, it was, I mean, this is just crazy, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it's just superb, this kind of stuff that you can dig out years after the fact. In my uh, in my sort of, in my mind, I'm dreaming of a, uh, a Dreamcast with a karaoke unit attached to the bottom of, the bottom of it. And then mm. the, uh, the PHS uh, modem as well with a little <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> that was the yeah. fun thing back then, though. I mean, all these accessories, like the uh, antenna looks like something that was like on my dad's bag cell phone like in right. his car back in the day but i mean that's like exactly what you think back then it always felt like all these console manufacturers were trying to like sneak a console into your home because oh it can do this too it can do that it's like when the playstation 2 came out i'm like well why would we buy a dvd player we can get a playstation and it plays dvds mm -hmm. fancy that but it's I always love going through these old accessories too, even with now like X band and everything or like Satellaview. They were always trying to be like, Oh, this also does your banking. Oh, this also can send email. It's like, it was basically like, I felt like developers ways of tricking parents into buying things that their kids wanted because they could also technically do something that they usually never did very well, but it's right. like the most creative way of being like, it's not just a games console. It's also a mobile, you know, hotspot. And, I miss those sort of innovations because now consoles, everything is just packed in the box and you're, there's no accessories you're adding to a PlayStation 5 or to an Xbox Series X. It's like, do I want extra hard drive space? Yeah, great. Let me just plug that in. But I remember all the wild accessories for Dreamcast and Saturn and PlayStation and just right. all those fun things. I kind of miss that about you know that generation of consoles because you do see these wild accessories that just serve one function and you're kind of wondering who that function was even for, but it was like just pure innovation. And I, I definitely miss that. Yeah. I, I would possibly even kickstart a, a, a fax machine add on for the Xbox <laughs> one and the <laughs> PS five. <laughs> I would, I would be up for that. I miss having my own email address that was connected to my dreamcast. You know, it was a uh, Tom, mm. Thomas Charnock at 
uk.dreamcast.com. I still remember it. I want my email address back. Sega, give me my email address back. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, moving on. There's another a couple of things here we're going to talk about. The, the first one is the Sega Dreamcast MIDI cable and Dreamcast sequencer. Uh, for sampling music so basically this cable uh, this actually was released in japan but sold in very very small numbers and th what this allowed you to do is connect a keyboard to your dreamcast and then use a sampling software to uh just well create music samples and put them on a timeline and a little bit like the uh, playstation game music but it actually allowed you to sort of record your own melodies um, and there are several videos of this up on youtube and it's worth checking out just because it's such a such a weird thing that you know nobody really ever talks about and it's just such another another um it's another example of sega's kind of innovation with the dreamcast this is the sort of thing you need to give to there's a, U a british youtuber called look mum no computer he, he does these like weird music experiments i remember there was a video where he did a like made a whole song on that that ps1 um sequencing software mm -hmm. he needs this and he needs to like produce like an album using the dreamcast yeah he needs to do that so uh, if he's listening which he probably isn't but <laughs> what, what would be even cooler is if um, one of the rappers who referenced the dreamcast in one of his songs in the article you did recently lewis could actually get in <laughs> yeah. touch with this guy and then release a song which was created on a dreamcast but actually also referenced the dreamcast we're getting a bit meta there, I think. But um, moving on very, uh, very, very slightly to uh, to some software. Uh, the Dreamcast obviously had um, things that were released for it that were not games. So we had things that were released that allowed you to uh, buy stocks and shares, allowed you to bet on horse racing. There was the whole uh, Toyota uh, release um, series that was for car showrooms. So you could go into a car showroom and have a virtual demonstration of a brand new Toyota Celica or any other type of uh, model that was catered for. Um, education as well. Education was a big thing. There was lots of different uh, web browsers that were released in some cases for individual schools in individual areas of Japan that was only usable in that, uh, in that location. And these are some of the rarest, um, most uncommon discs that you can actually find for the dream if you can find them at all that is um i know that mike has a few uh, mike is one of our other uh, presenters um anthony he's got a massive collection of dreamcast stuff and he's got some really kind of esoteric stuff that is literally for use in one area of japan um and yeah i just i just, I just, I just again going back to what i said earlier on i think it's fascinating how just what, what they envisioned, what Sega envisioned for the Dreamcast, you know, it wasn't just a games console. It was meant to be a, a whole life, a lifestyle kind of tool. You know, with the, the DreamEye camera, you've got email, you've got all these different applications. You know, obviously there were things like the uh, zip drive that was going to be released. There was the MP3 player. All of these things come together. If, if the Dreamcast had been the success that they were hoping it would be, it was going to be an entire, almost like a PDA, but in a console form if that makes sense yeah so this is kind of in my view i see the 90s as almost a return to the bubble of the 80s that japan had but not quite of the same magnitude so this kind of deep dive into japan as tom was saying with this uh, school learning software that works in this particular school and just this extremely targeted marketing and advertising and like trying to release things and just the idea, the vision of having the Dreamcast, you've got one at school and you can do all this stuff with it, education. And you come home, you've got a Dreamcast and you can play games. And then when dad comes home from the office job, he can print faxes, connect up his wireless modem and send the email. And, you know, it's just, or, or go on the stock market. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I have a theory on these discs too, and this is completely unfounded. So in 98, when back to, you know, there's always a connection of the 3DO M2, the Dreamcast for me, Sega had developed a demo for the 3DO M2 when they were thinking about buying it. And it was shown in 1998 when M2 would switch to an interactive kiosk. It was, I'm going to probably mispronounce it, Nami Amoro Digital Dance Mix. It's a really terrible Saturn game that I bought to check out. But when Panasonic had transitioned M2 to being an internet kiosk, they demoed the Sega game as part of the graphic potential. And then M2 went on to go to GM car dealerships in like 99, 2000 as an interactive kiosk where you could load up different 
Chevy models. I've got a disc in the other room for Pontiac, and I've never done a video on it because it's terribly boring. But Sega was working with Panasonic when they were rolling out the M2 technology for this kind of point of sale. Hey, check out this car software. So in my head, somehow Sega got the idea with working with Panasonic to do some of this car software because, you know, M2 had car software. It had school software. It had elder care memory training software. A lot of the things you see the Dreamcast doing in like 2000 to 2002, Panasonic had used M2 for in like 98, 99. So I wonder if that has some connection or if I'm just constantly connecting disparate things in my head. But it, to me, when I was looking at this again, I'm like, oh, I've seen this. It's what Panasonic did with the M2 hardware when they didn't release it as a console. They're like, we need to make money. What can we put on this thing? And I kind of feel the same way with a lot of this stuff. Like, you know, who would buy vegetables on a Dreamcast? Well, I don't know, somebody maybe. I'd love to have the software to see what it looks like. That, that is absolutely I, fascinating. I didn't, I didn't know that. And now you mention it, there's probably more going on in the background than we ever, ever knew. Um, between Sega and, and Panasonic. So, yeah, the, the Toyota thing certainly sounds like it may have come from what Panasonic was doing with the, uh, the you know, the, the car dealership stuff. I, I bet there was an awful lot of crossover because this, I think this is quite common when you're in a particular sector. You know your competitors and often your competitors are not actually, it's not this massive, I mean, it is a rivalry in business, but it's not this massive enemy or something like this you do sometimes share components like for example this apple iphone in front of me has a sony camera inside there so sony still makes money with every iphone and chipsets from panasonic and yamaha were in the dreamcast and uh, or in sega material and stuff like this and then you've got arcade divisions and r d and lots of crosstalk and supply and things like this and then this, mm. this also happens with marketing so i can really i think you raise a very interesting point there anthony especially with the timeline a lot of it makes a lot of sense that people employees for example could have joined from um uh, you know panasonic and go to sega and and stuff like this so yeah, I, I bet there's a lot more to it than just say, oh, that's an interesting coincidence or, or something like that. Never know. It's all uh, it's all very interesting. And I think everything ultimately is connected, certainly in the gaming sphere anyway, you know. But, um, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Right, guys, that um, has been an absolutely fascinating chat just to sit here listening to it, to be honest. I hope our listeners have also enjoyed uh, what we've spoken about on this episode. Um, I think we are going to wrap it up now. Um just remains for me to say um, a massive thanks to our guest, Anthony. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And um, yeah, for those people who don't maybe know your channel, uh, could you tell people where they can find you and your channel on the internet? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, guys. It's been fun to chat about this. It's always great to talk to other people who care about the same strange and esoteric things that I do. But you can find me on YouTube at Video Game Esoterica. It's probably the worst last name to choose because esoteric is a weird <laughs> word to write and people misspell it a lot but finally i've gotten popular enough that youtube will auto correct it for me <laughs> or if you just search 3do m2 i'm the only person talking about it so you'll definitely find my channel but we're doing i've got a gigantic series on the dreamcast and the naomi coming up probably late spring i'm going to be doing like oh, cool. 15 dreamcast games modifications i'm going to be talking about the naomi showing a bunch of really weird and strange Dreamcast stuff that I haven't done yet. So that should, I'm capturing it all now. And of course that's a massive undertaking, but hopefully like end of May, the channel will for one day a week have a Dreamcast video probably through fall. So that's fun, but yeah, it's been great chatting with you guys. And I mean, if anyone that's listening to this has any questions, if you want to find hardware, if you don't know how something works, just leave me a comment in my YouTube, wherever you feel like leaving it. I love talking to everybody and I've met a lot of people that want to get into this. They just don't know how to. And I'm always happy to help whoever needs help with whatever they want gaming wise. So if you're listening and you want to get into weird Dreamcast games, read the junkyard or ask me what my favorite one is, or if you want to find a 3DO arcade board, Tell me, I'll find one for you. I'm always happy to do it because I want more people to get into this stuff too because especially when you get to the niche stuff, it can get lonely sometimes. So <laughs> the more people, the merrier. Yeah. yeah, you sometimes wonder if you're just talking to yourself in the corner of a room, but there's there's plenty <laughs> out there. There's many many subscribers. And I would also say for, for, for your channel as well, what I personally love is the, the mix between the actual games and gameplay, but also the hardware side of things. So I think there's probably a bit of something for everyone if you're interested in this kind of 
this era of gaming really there's uh, a huge wealth there so uh, yeah uh, go check it out yeah totally and uh, on the on the uh, dreamcast stuff obviously we will do what we can to help share that and spread the uh, spread the love um Anthony, where can people find you on twitter as well so i'm on twitter at vg esoterica and on instagram i did it a long time ago i'm chicago game collector and you can look through my i post a photo a day of my game collection and everything from what i just bought last week to what i bought 15 years ago and people love looking at that because they'll be like oh you should do a video on that and i'm like yeah sure if you're interested go for it but that's where i am and it's been a ton of fun talking with you guys and you know i've always loved the dreamcast so it's great and an honor to be part of something like this because i've been reading the junkyard for forever and when you guys sent me a message being like would you be interested in being on i'm like well, hell yeah i'd be interested in being on it. <laughs> some of the games that i bought 10 years ago that i'd never heard of you know a lot of the like rare stuff like i found out through sites like this and that's why they're so great because you know games like lack of love or the lost golem people they never show up on lists you have to find mm-hmm. a site like the dreamcast junkyard to get them and then you know you might find your next new favorite game and that's why it's so great you guys do what you do because i even i read the site religiously and i see stuff that i didn't know existed and um, you know, none of us are encyclopedias, so the more we know, the more fun we get to have. Oh, that's amazing. Thanks very much for that. Very kind words. Um, wow, I feel a bit emotional now, actually, hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel yeah, it's, the it's... same way when anybody contacts me. I'm doing Uplink virtual. Uh, when this episode goes out, I'll probably be doing it right then and there. But a convention contacted me, and they're like, we love your channel. We want you to come do this virtual convention and talk about M2. I'm looking like over my shoulder like, are you sure you're talking to the right person? Me? You want to talk? You want me to talk to people online? Like, I'm still getting into that like mental space where I'm like, people actually care what I say. It's it's a weird thing, but I'm sure you guys get the same sometimes when people mention you, you're like, wait, no, not me. I just talk about random video game stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's surreal when I see people talking about myself, and I'm just like, I'm just some random guy. Why is people listening to me? Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. Um, okay, guys. Uh, Lewis, where can people find you on the internet? Um, you can find me on Twitter at LewisJFC uh, and also on the uh, the Junkyard uh, Twitter, which Tom will plug in a second, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, I've been uh, writing quite a few things on the Junkyard recently, so obviously my articles are on there. And actually, an article I'm currently in the midst of starting, I thought would be quite interesting, seeing as uh, Anthony's here, but I... I mean, you may have this magazine, Anthony, but uh, there's a uh, there was a fashion magazine released in Japan with Laura of D2 on the front modeling clothes by a, sp- a Japanese fashion designer. So I found this on a Japanese book store and I've ordered it because I'm like fascinated by like this is the extension of, you know, Kenji Ino's digital actress idea and I was looking at this archive of these fashion magazines and there's just all these covers with just, you know, models on the front and then there's just Laura smack bang in the middle. And I was like, what on earth is this? So I've ordered that <laughs> and I'm uh, looking forward to covering the uh, the article. It's quite a long article by the looks of it. I saw like a, a photograph of the content. So I'll be quite interested to see what it is. What, wow. what 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 were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that too because I've heard that that they were using her like I think Laura did like a water ad too in Japan. I've seen photos of, but I've never seen the magazine, so I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that because they were definitely pushing her as a character as much as they could, which was I think probably way ahead of its time. You have like you know these VTubers now on YouTube, like digital avatars being your actual business so i think even in that respect he was way ahead of his time definitely yeah (laughs) looking forward to that already lewis um martin where can people find you people can find me as a sega collection um scattered around various corners of uh, of the internet i'm doing a deep dive into some hardware kind of stuff these days so i'm hoping to yeah, I have some articles on the yard myself soon, um, but they'll be on 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 a, on a hardware side of things. Excellent stuff. And as uh, as Lewis alluded to, you can find us all as a collective on Twitter at the DC Junkyard on our blog, which is thedreamcastjunkyard.co.uk. We also have a Discord now. So if you type or if you look at our Twitter or look at our main site and switch to the desktop version, you'll see a link 
in the sidebar, click on that and join our Discord and come and talk to us. Um, we've also got a Twitch channel now as well. See, we're all we're, we're keeping up with technology you know, as time goes on. Um, only about 10 years late, but uh, we eventually <laughs> get there. Um, we've got a Twitch channel now. James has been doing some really cool uh, Twitch uh, stuff uh, along with Kevin and, and Mike. So uh, please do join us on Twitch as and when we are streaming. Um, that's That's about it once again. Anthony, thank you very much. And um, oh, thanks for having me, guys. It's been total fun. <laughs> indeed. We will see you on the next episode of the Dreamcast Junkyard Dream Pod. Uh, until then, goodbye. Please stop this disc now. 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 now.